<laughs> oh, these are very comfortable seats. More comfortable than I anticipated. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is, um, this is exciting. This is new for me. I haven't hosted an Earth Talk before. Um, it's a little bit weird to be sitting down and, and talking with you, but I think I'll adjust. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, I don't know how you've heard about it. We've tried to, uh, to reach out and get as many young people in the room as possible, and I see there are lots of young people, and that's amazing. <laughs> and it's great to see um, some older people, too. Thanks for coming, Nick. <laughs> Personally, you've raised the average age of the room considerably, and I appreciate that. Um, also, we'll, we'll be joined by lots of people on Zoom. I don't quite know how many. A fair number of people, and so we'll be hearing uh, some feedback from them later. I've got some thank yous, first of all. A huge thank you to Laura Henry, who is just uh, incredible, and she did so much of the heavy lifting on making this event happen. So big thanks to Laura, if you're any... Laura. <laughs> Also to uh, Adam and Patrick, who are handling all of the, the AV and, and stuff like that. Thanks to you guys as well. <laughs> and a big thank you to Ian Bright, because Ian, um, who is one of the co-founders of Tresshawk, has um, been going down to Kenya for various things over the, the years, was just down there on a project. and. Uh, he met Polly and introduced uh, Polly to us and has, has been uh, really the key in making all this happen. So thanks, Ian. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce everybody in a second. I'm Jay Tompt. I'm a lecturer on the Regenerative Economics Program. And uh, the Regenerative Economics Program has been going for about 10 years here at Schumacher College. Um, I know we have many students in the, in the audience tonight, and that's fantastic. Um, there are other programs here at Schumacher. Um, there's Regenerative Agriculture Program, uh, Master's and Undergraduate Program. There's Ecological Design Thinking. There's um, Engaged Ecology, Holistic Science. In fact, um, one of the most prominent graduates of Schumacher is playing, has played a key role at COP, Nigel Topping, um, who Polly says is a very nice guy, which is great to hear. Um, there's also another course, Movement, Mind, and Ecology. So uh, Schumacher has, uh, has grown a little bit with uh, its courses, and check them out if you're interested. So... Um, Joining me this evening, along with Polly, and I'll introduce Polly in a second, is Johara Balali. So jo Johara was on the program uh, last year on the Regenerative Economics Program. Uh, she has spent seven years in Kenya uh, working uh, in the climate arena on climate governance. Uh, she's also a doula and co-founder of the Mother Roots Project, along with Helen Jacoby. <laughs> so this is uh, a project being incubated by Transition Town Totnes. She also has a PhD, or she's working on a PhD, on the relationship uh, between, I probably shouldn't say it like that, but between childbirth and climate change, mm -hmm. something like that. So, um, so we'll be in conversation, and we'll be in conversation with the amazing uh, Polly Polly Najiri Owiti, she is uh, an agronomist in Kenya. She's been working for um, uh, change in agricultural methods in Kenya for uh, some time. But she's been a, a climate activist uh, over the past many years. She's an organizer of the COI-16 conference, uh, Conference of the Youth, uh, that runs right alongside COP, and it's... I suppose the purpose, we'll, we'll get into um, hearing more about, about COI, but I suppose the purpose really is to, is to try to hold those negotiators accountable. So we'll hear a little bit more about that. 
Uh, she was also a UN observer on the COP negotiations. So um, we've got lots to talk about and lots to explore. So please, everyone, uh, a warm welcome for Polly Najiri. <laughs> So, um, Polly, maybe just to get us started, um, like, why are you here? Why did you come to, to Glasgow? I know that, that you were uh, a contributor to the, the statement of the youth. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that process and how uh, young people can get involved. Well, thank you very much. And for the start, I've just met some three people who are also part of it but in the previous quiz. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Oh yeah, that there. Mm -hmm. So the Conference of Youth is uh, organized by Yongo. Yongo is the UNF Triple C uh, youth constituent. And it, every year it organizes alongside COP26, the Conference of Youth, where youth can give their voices or where youth can have a platform to air their views as part of the negotiation process. So instead, if they don't have the opportunity to get involved in the negotiations, they have opportunity to get involved in their statement through the Conference of Youth. So Conference of Youth is always organized yearly for the youth so that they can at least get the opportunity to tell world leaders that we want certain issues, these issues, and we have prioritized these issues so that you can work on them. Yeah, so um, this year, Koi was the 16th one, and it happened in Glasgow as well. And we had a youth statement uh, that uh, had around 40,000 voices. You don't have to be on actual uh, in-person event. You can also attend uh, in Zoom. So we have like this Google sheet that goes around to where you can write on your priority areas and how you feel, uh, what you feel like the negotiations should, the negotiators should tackle. So uh, this year we had about 40,000 voices from around the world that were captured in the youth statement that was presented on the 31st to the COP26 presidency. And it, it is important for every youth to actually get involved as this is a way of actually trying to show the world leaders that you also care and that there is an urgent need for action that they should take. And this action actually, this need actually depends on your future. Because if we are talking about the climate issues or the sustainability issues or even the environmental issues, but you keep quiet with them, you are not airing your views, then you, you, your future is not actually at the right hand. So what we are always trying to do with the youth statement and the conference of youth is ensuring that youth all over the world, especially those from the most affected areas and places, have their voices captured, if at least not on the in-person, but through the form that we always take around. So I'm looking forward for like youth from Totnes getting uh, part, being part of the uh, COI 17 next year and having their views heard and also tell, telling their leaders that we actually need these issues, these prioritized issues to be like worked on in the next COI 17, yeah. So, so you're saying that the young people here can get involved for next year? Oh yeah, you can get in, involved. We have different ways of getting involved. You can in, get involved as an organizer that is a volunteer. It's pure volunteer, you give your time it's not much of the time. You can decide to have like five hours a week. You just volunteer five hours a week to organize the event. So you can be an organizer. You can be in-person volunteer. You can be a delegate. So we have like delegates from each country. We ensure that we capture all of the countries and also work on the possibility that people have their means of going there unless otherwise. So. If you look at the, uh, um, it's called the website, our website, you'll get ways of getting involved. So you choose which one best fits you. If you feel you don't have time at that particular point to organize as a volunteer, you can come in as a delegate. 
and uh, take part in all that we are doing here. It was a really impressive document. Uh, it's online, 81 pages, 15 themes. I was wondering, how was it when you presented it, when you handed over that document to, uh, in, in Glasgow to the, to the presidency? Okay, it, it, it's always the same way. We have been uh, presenting all these documents from Koi 1 to now Koi 16. It's the same way. Like, they'll take the document, go through it and see which thematic areas really fit with theirs. Then they'll, they'll pick those ones and add on their negotiation areas. So um, the handing over is always like sort of a, a, an event, a ceremonial event, always on the, the last day of the conference and the first day of the conference of parties. So you realize after opening the conference of parties, then we have the um, handing over of the COI 16 COI statements. So we just hand it over to them, tell them that this is what the youth want and these are, our, these are our priority areas, or rather you call them the thematic areas that we want you to look at and see if they are the same with yours so that you can adopt some of them. Yeah. So one of the points there was local governance and how from the local level, um, there is actually the voice that can be heard. So I was wondering for the youth today, um, what would you tell them to show them that their voice can be heard, that the processes are in place also maybe in their, in their gov governments, in their own countries? How did you do it in your own country? Well, uh, I was also part of the country. I was the country coordinator also of Kenya in Koi 16. So what I will do, uh, you find that most people are really acting, but they don't have the, uh, the opportunity to be online and fill those forms, the opportunity to air their views. So we always have these, uh, the youth groups that we have set up. So we will talk, organize a, a meeting and talk. During the talks, we note down the important information that they are giving us. As, a, a, as the country coordinator, your work is to note all this information down and send on their behalf. So if I organize a meeting like this and we are a group of a certain institution like this one, so I will go and present this, that the youth of this institution actually said this. So it's upon you, the leader, the coordinator, or whoever you call yourself, to just come bring people together and then listen to what they are saying and present it. So it should not be that somebody did not present his or her own views or the points because of a certain barrier. If you have the possibility of bringing them together or even telling them to send you the information, then you can send. That's how we came up with the 40,000. If it were that mm. other, other people did not have the opportunity to send in, then it will be difficult. Yeah. So every voice is heard. Basically. Every voice is heard. In fact, we call it mapping. So with mapping, there, there are forms for the groups. There are forms for institutions. So with the institution, you can send, you can have a contact point either through the dean. So you send to the dean. It's upon the dean to call one person to be in charge. So uh, the information will be sent through the institution rather than a, a single person sending it. So there are different mapping points organization, uh, governments, institutions, and even the people that prefer sending personal statements, they also have their choice to send in the personal statement. So it's upon you to what works best for you. Yeah. So climate change uh, is an urgent problem. Did you feel like when you handed over the statement that, well, job done, now something's going to happen? I always have that feeling every time. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be done. <laughs> well, it actually needs to be done. They need to act. Like I'm always positive while handing something over. All the statements, all the policies, all the declarations I've handed over, I always have that feeling that it should be done as it is written there. And there's actually need for them to do it because looking at 
climate change issue is a no joke. And people like me, I'm from an area where we are feeling it every single day. Temperatures in my area go up to 44. Yes, I am a South Sudanese. We migrated to Kenya to look for better places. If you see the South Sudan area, it's very dry. So people move out of those places to go in other places. So if I could, my parents could move out of South Sudan, settle in Kenya, then why not take the initiative? If I know very well I want to live in a better place, why not take the initiative of starting to act now? And <clears throat> why not be positive if I'm handing over such important uh, documents to the leaders? It is actually mandatory for them, even though it takes time, it is mandatory for them to act. It is upon us to act, yeah. And, if, and of course, this is not the only uh, course of action that is available to us. Mm -hmm. So um, what else can you say about what some of the other young people were doing up there in Glasgow? We had a lot of young people in Glasgow, and most of the people came in to like show world leaders this need for acting through the demonstrations. We had a lot of demonstrations going on. I was coming in and I saw somebody with an Extinction Rebellion stuff. He's <laughs> <laughs> so a guy. So we had such groups that those that were taking place outside the blue zone, those those were taking place inside the blue zone. There were those that were taking place at the green zone. So uh, you realize that when the debates and the uh, the world leaders were like doing their negotiations. We had those people that were demonstrating outside the exact uh, building they were doing the negotiations of their talks. Example is when Obama came and he was giving his speech, there were the youths outside carrying banners. Where are our money? Where are our, we are watching you? Like these placards written all sorts of information because they needed uh, to see the change. And those were some of the things the youth were doing. Of course, there were some side events organized by the youth organizations. And also within the blue zone and the green zone. Yeah, and it was quite a lot going on there. So what's, what is the blue zone and the green zone? And and uh, what is the, the relationship between COI and COP in terms of like, location and timing? Okay, COI is the conference of youth. COP is the conference of parties. So COI takes place right before COP. Why we always plan COI right before COP so that we can hand over uh, our views to the leaders so that they don't say it was late. You and they have all the reasons to say that you did not bring it on time. Now you are bringing it on time and you are giving them right when they are starting. So the conference of youth is basically for the youth below 35. Those that are doing, uh, are working on different areas that are kind of related to uh, climate change. It doesn't have to be really climate change, but it's related to climate change or you see the urgency or the need to take action on climate change, then the conference of parties is where like parties come to negotiate on some of the policies, some of the issues they see it's important. All are under UNF C, because CO is also organized by the youth constituents of UNF C. So we have two zones in COP, the blue zone and the green zone. The blue zone is where you, uh, you go in when you have a, a badge a badge is the accreditation that the UNF C gives you, United Nations Framework Conventions on Climate Change. They do give a badge. So the, uh, there is an observer badge and there's a party badge. Party badge are given to the specific country governments so that they can distribute to their negotiators who are coming to negotiate. Then the observer badge, you're just coming to observe them negotiating. So the observers always see the need of t like doing something in this conference of parties. That's why they organize like side events. That's why they organize like these um, strikes and the demonstrations you see outside. But you don't have to have a, part a badge 
to demonstrate. If that demo the demonstration is outside the blue zone, then you don't need a badge. If it's inside, you'll need a badge. But mostly those that make impact, those that make um, negotiators feel shameful are those that happen inside the blue zone. And then the green zone is, uh, the green zone is outside where side events or organizations or projects showcase their staff, they showcase their events, they have like si some side events out there. Yeah, it's, it's actually different from the blue zone. Yeah, and you don't need a badge to go there. Yeah. You were a UN observer. Oh, yes. In, did you notice anything? Did you observe anything that surprised you? Oh, yeah. Um, I observed something that surprised me. Negotiations can go up to 11 hours. <laughs> 11 hours objecting one word. 11 hours saying, I, I, we should not be facing it out. We want it to be faced down. Someone saying down, someone saying out for 11 hours. <laughs> so <laughs> that's something that did not talk away with me. And I remember leaving a certain a negotiation room. I was like tired because it, it had gone for four hours and they're arguing about a word, a word that they could easily pick, a word that somebody at the end will be the top decision maker. And the person who is the top decision maker is also seated there looking at you. Why, could, why are you going on with that? So I just had to leave the room and go do some stuff. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, so I joined a side event. Uh, the side events are actually good. You get to see innovations, uh, innovative ideas that people are coming up with, projects that people are doing that you can actually replicate in your areas. So, at the side events, mm. yeah. And so what was one of the, the most interesting innovations that you saw? I was talking to Brian about this, about this guy that was showcasing a machine that uh, produces clear sparkling water. It just captures the, the air, like here, and then through its processes, it produces a drinking water, and I was quite impressed by that. And um, another one was that in, uh, infrastructure and creating green spaces in uh, in uh, um, the World Cup 2022. The one is going that is going to take place in Qatar. So they were displaying this study uh, and showcasing how. Since the announcement that uh, the World Cup was going to be in Qatar, so they have created a lot of green spaces and have helped them improve their infrastructure when it comes to sustainability and how they've handled all that. So those are the top things that captured my mind. Yeah. And what were some of the other um, things that really stuck with you from this experience? Because I, I just imagine that uh, the conference is just kind of a a chaotic, really stimulating experience when you're going from one thing to the next and people are tugging at you and you're in conversations here and there. And I suppose after a while it blurs, but but there must be, have been some things that really stuck with you that you're going to take back with you when you go home. Oh, yes. Um, I came out of that conference saying, next time I'll be a negotiator. Mm. And... <laughs> Decide on that word. <laughs> <laughs> next time I'll be a negotiator and have the party buzz, because I really want to uh, help in negotiating. So that really stuck, is, that is stuck with me. I really want to do such thing, because I found out that most of the people come to a negotiation room, but just as me, they got tired. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get tired. But maybe they don't give their views. They're just, they are listening. And if countries can really, if one country can make a whole change, because I saw it's India. Mm -hmm. India was the country that brought all the changing of the, the last draft. If only one country can bring the changes that object everything, what if like we had three that, uh, that object, but object positively, mm -hmm. not negatively? So I promised myself next time 
I'll go to COP when I'm a, an a actual negotiator, mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to doing those negotiation and diplomacy stuff. Then also um, work on the equity, the equity issues when it comes to negotiation processes. Uh, looking at the, if you are in a negotiation room, most of them are men, actually old men. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I thought that need a change. And um, next time coming, I would actually talk to some of the uh, ministers about how they, will, how they choose their negotiators and how they, they should be involving them, yeah. So I see Greta, the Ugandan Vanessa, you, Polly. Do you think there's some magic girl power? Yeah, there. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, I've seen few, 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 few youth, uh, male youth doing the activism stuff. I don't know, maybe they're doing, but they're not in the limelight. But those that are in the limelight are very few. Yeah, I, we, we should like we should do something about the men. We have been empowering the women a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we should do something about the men. Yeah. Do you think maybe? The care is different? Not really. Maybe they don't just like, um, how do I say it? They don't like being seen in the limelight or something, because they are there, but they're not in the limelight. Maybe they just don't want to be seen in the limelight, but it's time they come out. Because I always, I always feel that information is hard when you come out. And if you just say it among a, a small as here, then it's not going to go out there. And then one thing is that women are aggressive. They love their, uh, um, their side or point of view being heard outside. See how they shout. Uh, maybe that's why they are all over. But men also are there, but they, they really don't speak out much. Yeah. But you'll find them in the ne negotiations room. They're the same people objecting for 11 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get, uh, how do we bring more young people and more young women to the table in places like COP and other places where such decisions are being made? Well, for the young people uh, in the negotiation room, uh, it depends with their Actually, it depends with their country. And I feel like young people are there. They have the information. They have the opportunities. But they are not given the right platform. Because for you to come to a, something like COP, you, you must be known very well by your country. You must be active uh, in, your, in the climate or youth stuff. So it actually depends with the country, but they have uh, they need to be given more platforms. The youth themselves need to take these platforms because uh, most of them sit back. They're, they're just laid back waiting for the decisions to be made. Then they'll be saying that the decision was not made in our... Um, they didn't go well with what we were saying, but they were sitting back. They did not actually try to air their voice or something. So maybe they can look for platforms where they can just have the opportunity to air their views. They can have that aggression. It's important. Actually, it is good to be aggressive because uh, in the world of today, things only work when you want them by force. But if you are laid back, it never works. For women, we, uh, we are actually having a, we, uh, a good number of opportunities for women. It's the number of women in leadership positions are coming up. We didn't have much, that much before. Though we really, really, really don't have a good number. They also need platforms uh, for them to start airing their views. Uh, on, I don't know, it, it was either Monday or Tuesday or last week, we had a meeting as, I popped into a meeting of the Kenyan negotiators and I was asking, the top negotiator of Kenya, why are women not here? Because apparently, 
we were only two women in the room, the director of Climate Change Kenya and me. The other one was the one carrying the handbag for the governor, so he was not part of the negotiation team. So I asked him, and he started by telling me a story that we had women, but there was a little bit of wrangling here and there, so the women got tired, and then uh, walking up and down was an issue for them. <laughs> that this week you are in this event, next week you are needed somewhere, the other week you are needed somewhere, so they felt that it was too much. So you find them attending one, then they'll give a break for the others, then they'll attend the other, the other events, so it's, it's an issue of time to them. So they prefer what to attend and what not to attend, yeah. But generally, we need to join organizations or initiatives that actually offer such opportunities for the youth, then uh, awareness have been given much, so we can't say that it's really awareness unless it, has, it is at the local level where people don't have, uh, don't have this information, but awareness have been given much, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit what you do in Kenya and what kind of projects you've been involved in and leading? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the founder of the Poly Foundation. So the Poly Foundation train local small-scale farmers on organic farming. So instead of using like these agrochemical products, you get to use the compost, the mulch, or you go the permaculture way. So uh, this started uh, way before. I'm from a farming background, and you find that when we farm, uh, there's no much input. First, there's no much input. Secondly, the, uh, there's no much yield, then the input is quite expensive. So being that the input is quite expensive, you don't get to buy these fertilizers or the pesticides. I saw that there's need for like starting to have a way of producing my own pest fertilizer and producing my own pesticide. So uh, I started by producing one from py pyrethrum. Um, you're aware of pyrethrum. So the pyrethrum flowers contain this pyrethrin that I usually crush and make with like pesticides to spray in the armyworms. Armyworms really attack the maize and the vegetables. So that's what I make for the uh, small-scale farmers. And then the um, organic farming. Uh, I have background in agriculture, and so I can uh, show them some of the agronomic practices that they need to have their, their farms uh, increase yield. And also, um, being that they were using a lot of uh, fertilizers before, the soil have really lost its fertility. So if they get to use this uh, organic uh, manure or organic uh, inputs that I'm providing to them, at least the farm gets to increase its fertility. Apart from that, I've been involved in different campaigns uh, that are aimed at climate activism. The first one being uh, Save Nairobi National Park. So Save Nairobi National Park, Park is a campaign that we did to stop the government from allowing a private investor to build an airstrip in the Nairobi National Park. So we had an investor that wanted to build an airstrip in the park, and we felt that that will uh, interfere of the of the uh, wildlife. And then since the Nairobi National Park is where the Maasai live. In Maasai, the land is communally owned. So if the land is communally owned, why will somebody private that have not consulted the people come and build something in a, in a, in a community land? So we, we had that campaign that went well, and um, the airstrip was never built. So, and then again, uh, we were involved in another one called Africa is Not a Dumpster. So basically, Africa is not a dumpster is a campaign we got from, uh, I saw the newspaper written U.S.-Kenya trade deal. So the U.S.-Kenya trade deal was allowing the U.S. 
to bring 500 million tons of plastic to Kenya so that they can build a recycling company. Uh, they felt that Kenyans, most of the Kenyan youth are unemployed, and if they build the recycling company in Kenya, it will provide job opportunities for the Kenya. But basically, it's coming to dump all their plastic waste in Kenya. So after seeing this, together with other youth, we formed a campaign called Africa is not a dumpster. So Africa is not a dumpster will actually block um, uh, this trade deal so that it don't happen. So we got, uh, we got support from Greenpeace and uh, Extinction Rebellion. So with Greenpeace and Extinction Rebellion, they had to write uh, to the media stations. They had to write to the, uh, uh, the US Senate so that they can stop this trade deal. And one thing about Kenya is that if there's something of gone to the international light or exposure, uh, they, they are kind of afraid <laughs> and they won't go on with that. So uh, the government had to stop it. So they stopped it for a while. And after that COVID strike and yeah, they have not done that so far. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> And on top of that, I organize events like climate events that are aimed at educating or involving the youth into climate action, like the mock COP, where we produced a treaty. It's sort of a declaration that had 18 policies talking about climate and ecological crisis. So uh, mock COP was, uh, uh, was to cover up for the postponed COP. So COP was to take place last year but it didn't take place. So we saw that if COP was to take place and it did take place, why can't we have our mock COP for the youth, by the youth? So we organized a mock COP. We called it mock COP 26, mm -hmm. where we also had it for two weeks, the same way COP is two weeks. And we, had, we came up with our own declaration that had 18 pol policies. That's the same one I was telling you we, we presented to Nigel Topping and so it was good. Right now, we, uh, we have like delegates in each country. So each delegate is presenting this to their local government or their national government to see which one they can actually focus on. And by, by this year, Nigeria and Turkey had already adopted some. So one of them was bringing youth delegates to attend the actual COP. So Nigeria actually had six delegates who are youth from when the Senate received um, the mock crop treaty. They said that they will bring six delegates and they brought the six delegates. And also Turkey said that they will adopt the climate education where they start teaching kids about climate issues and ecological issues at younger age. So they are doing the same with that. We are looking at many countries adopting these treaty so that we can have like most of the part of the of the treaty adopted yeah so you're working at the international level yeah. and you're working at the national level and you're working at the local level exactly wow <laughs> there's one more project i want to ask you about and that is the center for uh innovation science and technology <laughs> Can you say a few words about that? Yes. So the Center for Innovation, Science and Technology deals with uh, production of bioethanol through water hyacinth. So in most cases, it, uh, from where we come from, people use firewood and charcoal as a source of energy to cook. So since firewood and charcoal like requires you to cut down so many trees and it actually takes a long time it's tiresome so we found that this through ian <laughs> actually i was introduced to the project through ian they are producing like uh bioethanol 
through water hyacinth. So water hyacinth in a, is an invasive species in the lake, so Lake Victoria. It has brought in a lot of problems here. It chokes fish because it takes up a lot of oxygen. If you go fishing, the boat will be stuck. So uh, the government have really tried hard to remove it, but apparently it produces around 10,000 seeds per flower. So it's very difficult to do away with it. So at CIST, we actually take the water hyacinth and use it to produce bioethanol fuel that people use in their homesteads to cook. So it's quite cheap compared to charcoal and compared to firewood. Yeah. And also it's it doesn't produce CO2 that affects people. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Should we open it up for questions? Yeah. Yeah. Probably you, you all have a bunch of questions. So we have a roving microphone. And um, maybe we'll start with the people who are in the room and then see if we've got any questions from the people who are watching on Zoom. So who's got a question? Muriel. Just wondering about these um, water hyacinths. And if, if you're using it for ethanol, is it? Um, can you actually, is, is the quantity of those hyacinths going down slightly, even slightly? <laughs> because I, I just am aware of how choking those type of plants can be. So I'm just wondering how, whether, you're, whether you're starting to see an improvement as well as uh, furnishing um, uh, an, a better form of heating, uh, whether there's also a, a benefit for the actual health of the lake. Well, as at now, it is being produced at a small scale level. And just as I told you, it, it sprouts very fast. Yeah. So there have not been much improvements. It's just a matter of making use of the water hyacinth as per now. Yeah. Uh, in, in the um, statements that were produced by Koi, or that list of the, the, the mock cop put together that youth. What were policies regarding um, oil and gas in particular? What were the youth saying into COP26 about particularly oil and gas? Well, that have been quite a rumble for some time, especially after uh, the statement that the final decision that was made because everybody, the youth organizations and COI 16 statement were about facing out the call, but it, that was not the uh, that was not the final decision that was made. So uh, as much as we had facing it out, especially the uh, the call, we also had issues of. Um, sustainable drilling, especially in Africa. You've heard about the issue of Okavango, where people are, uh, the government gave permission for investors to drill the oil, but they are not doing it in a sustainable way. So one of our statements was to stop it for a while, then they can look for alternatives of drilling it in a sustainable way that do not affect people that are living around, because you cannot wake up to a sooty environment, to an environment that really harms your health. So one of, uh, one of our recommendations was about uh, stopping it and waiting for time to do it in a sustainable way. Yeah. What was, what was one of the uh, most provocative demands? That, that we made? had? Hmm. Uh, channeling money to the new loss and damage. The, this mm. thing we were introducing, apart mm. from the climate finance and the, that uh, also have the adaptation finance, we wanted to introduce the loss and damage finance so that we have climate finance on its own, we have loss and damage finance on its own. So the loss and damage finance will focus only to the vulnerable countries, the developing countries, particularly in Africa, but not other places. So. We want it to be divided. We don't want 
climate finance to cover all these areas, but we want climate finance specifically for adaptation because we were not much interested in mitigation than loss and damage for specific countries in Africa. Yeah. So there was a chunk of money agreed for adaptation and another chunk that was being negotiated at this COP around loss and damage, right? Can you say more, a little bit more about what that is all about? So uh, the climate finance is the usual one that uh, they, they always give out to compensate for um, for the to compensate for the adaptation issues, the adaptation project, but the loss and damage specifically, you find uh, the idai that happened in Mozambique. People lost their houses, people lost their properties, but we feel that that is partially part because of climate change. So it caused a lot of people to lose their li life, a lot of people to lose their staff. So we wanted a finance channel that could actually go to such um, initiatives in case they happen, so that we want it different, really, really different from the climate one. And for, for this one, something that was different with it is that it's given immediately. Climate finance takes time for it to come, and it's channeled through to the government directly. But this one, it's channeled when it happens to the community directly, but not passing through these governments, but the governments were the ones negotiating about it. Yeah. Mm. Any, um, Mike? Um, what do you think the world is going to look like uh, when you're old? I have no ideas. <laughs> A hopeful me wants a utopia. Mm -hmm. I want to wake up to uh, a world where everywhere is green and to wake up to a world where flowers are sprouting even on the streets. I want to wake up to a world where in you can actually see insects passing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wake up to a world where everything is gone. Mm -hmm. So when I'm old, I want everywhere to be green. When I'm old, I want people to have relationship with nature. I want people that are taking care of their actual environment and not like grabbing stuff, depriving, depriving nature on, of their rights, people that are polluting the environment. But I want to see a clean river passing by. When I was young, I used to see clean rivers, but right now I'm old. I don't even see clean rivers. I want to see the same clean rivers when I'm old. I want to see trees sprouting. Flowers everywhere, yeah. I think probably we all would like to see mm -hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions from the Zoom folks? Not at the moment. Okay, well, Zoom folks, um, type in into the chat any questions or comments you'd like to share. A um, couple right there. Hi, Polly. Good to see you again. I'm curious, what keeps you resourced in your activism? Like, what, what helps you when you meet challenges or struggles in what you do? What, where do you find, yeah, resource from? Uh -huh. Thank you for that question. So, basically... Activism, I don't do it as myself. We, we are a group. And when we go through these challenges, we go through these challenges as a group. And mostly, when we have challenges, we just talk to each other, tell each other about how it was, then laugh it off and continue. We still have to do it. <laughs> uh, during the campaign for Save Nairobi National Park, I remember uh, the Minister of Tourism being that he was part of the people that were uh, bringing in the investors, said that is uh, the activists that are talking about Seven Nairobi National Campaign are making noise and is coming for them. So <laughs> I saw that on the news and my face was there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was in Nairobi by then. 
I had to go back to my hometown after calling my people that, have you seen the news? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes, all of us. We went back um, to our villages and were like, let's keep it cool for some time. Mm -hmm. And you keep off social media for some time. Then you come back later. So what really uh, keeps us going? We are doing this as a group, and I'm not doing it alone. So if, if you are doing it as a group, then the others continue doing it, you already have hope. And the fact that we want it to be done the way we want it, and the it should be done, mm. really, really gives us a lot of hope. Yeah. Um, who inspired you to like do this, to pursue like this? Pardon? Um, who like kind of inspired you to do what you do right now? Oh, what really inspired me? Mm. Oh yeah. So mm. back then, uh, I was in the agriculture class, and this agriculture class they were talking about climate change as a unit. And the teacher was talking about, the lecturer was talking about what we already know. Like, crops are failing. Yes, we already know that. This is happening. We, we could relate that with act, the actual things that are going on. So after relating this, then we were like, why can't we do something? And there was already a group in Nairobi that was doing the same thing. So... I, I went to a uh, school that is two hours from Nairobi. So when uh, I decided to myself that I want to join that group so that I see and know what they were doing. And uh, by then, they were doing this mangrove stuff, planting of mangroves, the, activist, the street activism and stuff. So I joined them and I found that you can make friends out of this. I was that quiet person and when I was with them I I felt like I'm a different person <laughs> I was actually a different person and I f uh, when I went back to school I felt that oh, I love the person I was out there mm -hmm. rather than I am in school so I attended their second event it was quite wild I loved it mm -hmm. third event mm -hmm. I had to go back again, and that's how I got stuck with them. And they're my friends up to now, mm. so <laughs> it was quite amazing. That's how I started my activism, and just be, because I get people that are of my same are of the same age to me, and they are not giving up on whatever they are doing. I feel like that's the, the group I should be with, uh, being that the fact being that they are doing something that can actually change our future. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, at the top. Hi, yeah, uh, and thanks so much for, for everything you said so far. Um, I'm I'm really interested in more in hearing more about what young people were demanding. So you mentioned loss and damage and you mentioned a couple of other things. I'm really interested in some of the other demands that young people were making and what were the kind of the key things coming through uh, from, from young people. And then also, like, what do you see as some of the main barriers to those things being achieved or being adopted? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Am among what I've mentioned, another key issue that was coming up was the adaptation. In, uh, when we were coming as a coalition, we were talking about in, uh, how do I say it? In support of the MAPA. So in, in support or in collaboration with the MAPA is in support or in solidarity with the most affected people and areas. So MAPA, most affected people and areas. So, uh, we had these priority areas for the MAPA people adaptation being part of it, because we felt that mitigation is not sort of the MAPA people's thing, and they are looking, they're already affected, and they want ways of adapting to these issues. So another thing was the adaptation and the adaptation funds and how they could actually be helped 
and policies that comes with adaptation. So that was another key area. So uh, another key area was quite on engagement of the youth, uh, engaging the youth in such talks and ensuring that they are represented well. However much there was no engagement in the uh, of youth in the negotiation platforms, but we were uh, eyeing for it and we are hoping to continue with the same and have youth represented in the next. Um, what I was telling you about the Stockholm, so after, after like these wrangles and noise and everything, they thought they should have a youth task force in some of the uh, negotiations of climate issues. They have like the, uh, the Stockholm plus 50 and they launched a youth task force in COP26 where they are inviting 18 youth to be part of the Stockholm plus 50 to discuss about climate issues. And another way they are also involving youth, that, but they started before, was having a Youth Policy Advisory Council for the United Nations Secretary General. And their term is almost coming to an end. That started last year. So those are the ways they are having to involve the youth. Um, what was the second question? The barriers. Yeah, it was about like, barriers to those actually coming into oh yes the barriers of like involving youth or oh oh yes the barrier you find that most of these requests are already things that are there the the requests we have are already things they know they have and they have put down we are not the first people telling them about the adaptation. We are not the first people telling them about loss and damage. Neither are we the first people telling them about fossil fuel. They know they are involved. COP itself was financed by some of the fossil fuel companies. Next, some, uh, some of the uh, negotiators were, were associated with um, fossil fuel. So they know this very well. And... There's no way that we will be telling them that for the first time. So barrier being that they're not listening, they won't listen to us because we are telling them what they already know. And uh, some of the things they don't like, because I was talking to some adults, they're like, the strategies are very poor. We, we, are, we are going to make noise to them while they're negotiating. What are we doing? They feel like we are making noise to them. Even though the, that is a positive noise, that is the noise they would want to hear for them to act. They feel that we are making noise for them. And then uh, some of the issues are they don't actually involve the youth in the actual table. So that might be a very big barrier. If you don't bring them to the negotiation team and if you, if you just have their papers there to read on what they told you, which you already feel that it's part of what you have, then they won't listen to you that much. So at least if we will have that youth on the same platform, to be it be a 50-50 thing, maybe um, some of the statements or our voices will be heard perfectly. Yeah. So how can you hold the decision makers accountable for their promises? Because they do make promises. They, say, they sign papers. How... Do you, how would you say we can hold them accountable? Well, uh, holding leaders accountable is quite a big one, and that is done by the public. <laughs> and they're the same politicians we vote in. They are the same people we vote in. They are the same people that go to negotiate with you. They are the same people that go to make policies there. So the same way they came to you campaigning, with the, uh, t promising you is the same way you should go to the street and tell them, we want you to do this. You promised you will do this. You told us you are going to do this. Why not go back to that office and tell them? Then use media as a tool. Mm. Media is uh, quite influential, be it the print media or any, source, uh, any potential media. You can use that right uh, write your views, call the press and tell them your views. So they'll feel there's a need actually to do this. 
but in most cases, our leaders, they're just our leaders, because I've never seen, okay, I might be wrong here, but mostly politicians, be, being that they are the same negotiator and they are the ones that make the policies, those people change as, uh, as they get, the moment they get into the office, they change, they have a different viewing point of stuff. So I don't know really how we could hold them accountable, but street is a good one. Having talks with them is a good one. Pressuring them through the media is a very nice one, yeah. Here's the question. Th thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to how to make them accountable thing. Uh, I think uh, co-op co in itself is not the whole thing we are all, you know, involved with. You know, my experience of the blue zone and the green zone was pretty depressing. And it's not the first time, like, when I was in co-op in Paris in 2015. So I think... I think uh, Organizing outside of COP is, is the real need. And I think we as youth and, and as civil society, I think we need to uh, also realize sooner that COP might not be the, uh, you know, the leading solution to systemic change. And I think, I think the sooner we realize as youth or you know, civil mobilizers that a systemic change will not come from the system itself. I think uh, we should start, you know, not just demanding as a youth, but to start organizing for the alternative. I think I came to Totnas after COP because I, I, I really believe this is where the real thing is happening, you know. That's where the recipe is being uh, built, COP, but this is where the foods are being grown, mm -hmm. the solutions. So. Yeah, I just wanted to share that in the in the discussion. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think in all in all fairness, there's change popping up all over the place. So it's not just in in Totnes, although we do get some credit for doing some things. But it's happening in many places. Um, oh, what's his name? Paul Hawken. You guys all know Paul Hawken. So he wrote a book recently called The Blessed Unrest, where he, they just tried to catalog all the things that are happening all over. And there's just hundreds of thousands of, maybe millions of initiatives happening all over, but we don't hear them, hear about them, because they're not, you know, they're not the kind of thing that attracts eyeballs to our, our uh, corporate press. Did you want to respond to Shail's comment? I had a thought, um, if that's okay to interject here. Um, very much what can be done outside of the COP is also looking at the cycles. Um, very often the budget cycles um, is a really good way to plug in. And because most of the local governments, most of the regional governments have to tell the national government, this is what we are doing in terms of climate change. There are some mechanisms in, in place. So when, when you know when to plug in your project at the right moment so that there is an open door, um, for, for it to become financed, or maybe there's a new strategy, a new plan of action that needs to happen. Those are the moments to plug in. So really being aware of the cycles, uh, the, the, the climate cycles or any development financial cycles in, in the structures are, are often very useful as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think... Yeah. Jem has a question down yeah. here. Hi, Polly. Um, I'm interested in if there's a split in Kenya with people who are um, very aware of climate change or, or also groups that are sort of resistant to it being a reality, because over in the West we've had that a lot. And it, if that's the case where you've got that split of people not either believing in it or wanting to take action, what have you seen has been really useful in reaching out to those groups to on board them to inspire them to um, bring them in to become involved? Well, uh, the issue in Kenya about climate change is that p 
people feel it's not a priority. But they feel at, at the same time, they don't know that the problem they are undergoing is somehow connected to these climate issues. Let me give you a, uh, an example of last year and this year. Uh, we had floods, extreme floods in my area. So the government was helping and the Red Cross were also helping. But before the floods were over, we had uh, the desert locust that came from Somalia to Kenya. So the government had to divert from the floods and start tackling locusts because locusts were affecting the farms. And that's where our, every, our lives is. So they had to divert to the locust. Before the, they even finished the locust stuff, we had COVID. So again, a very major issue, the government had to divert in COVID. COVID, then there were prolonged droughts in the northeastern part of Kenya. They had to send people there to bring issues to, uh, to help, to help in the issues of um, drought. So this sort of stuff were interlinked, but the people do not really do not really understand that maybe the drought or the floods is kind of connected to climate change. So if you go tell them about climate change, they will not really understand. But you bring to them to a point that we used to have like two rainy seasons before. Why is it that we have one rainy season right now? You, why are you not planting in January the way you used to plant in January? You have to relate to them to something that they really understand, something they relate to. So you have to bring in the issue of agriculture because that's something that they really focus on. You tell them, you had two rainy seasons before. Now you had one rainy season in a whole year and you're not getting the exact input you were getting before. What might be the problem? So you bring to them to us as such a point. But if you just go and tell them, you know, we have climate issues and it's affecting us, they'll tell you, no, I slept hungry yesterday. What will climate help me with? So... Just we, we do relate to them and tell them the solutions. We, you can plant trees. You also give them the solutions they know. Plant trees, instead of planting the corns, you can plant cassavas. So we have drought-resistant crops that we give to them, like the sweet potatoes, like the cassavas. We also tell them about the groundnuts and the sorghum, millet. Like we give them solutions that can actually help them on that because... When we were doing the drought-resistant stuff and they saw that the input was of the drought-resistant crops were high, and like the inputs of the maize and beans they are used to, they had to divert, have a little bit of maize and beans, but have the actual uh, crops that are drought-resistant also. So you just have to tell them from a point of view that they really understand and they really relate to. But telling them that there's something called climate change they will not listen. Yeah. You um, you used the word solidarity a few moments ago. Uh, what does what does that mean to you? Pardon? Solidarity. Mm -hmm. Solidarity in climate change issues. Well, you mentioned uh, you were talking about MAPA. Oh, MAPA, and, in solidarity and, with MAPA. And you were in solidarity with MAPA. Yeah. But I guess I'm sitting here thinking that uh, you're a young person, you're a woman, you're from Kenya, and, and here you are in this country. And um, uh, this word solidarity is something that, that gets used quite easily mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but... What might it mean if we really practiced it? I mean, what, I guess, you know, my question, I'm trying to be provocative yeah. a little, little bit, but like, <laughs> what can we really do to be in solidarity? Support some of the policies that we have proposed. Uh, like the, the previous one I was telling you, when they said they're in solidarity with the MAPA people, they are in solidarity with the people that are most affected. So we give them. Uh, the issues that most affect us and we look for solutions together so they help us in pushing for these solutions. Right now, we had uh, these key three key issues that uh, we brought in, including the loss and damage. They said they were not interested much in loss and damage finance, but they would push their 
to produce some uh, some of the funds to cater for the lost and damaged fighters. So if they are helping push the, uh, in pushing their leaders, if they are helping us in striking and telling the leaders that you should produce these lost and damaged funds to Africans, then that's their standing in solidarity with us. And if at all, all of them be in solidarity with us, then we could have that and we could help the most affected people. Another one being the RECON. So RECON is an initiative in Liberia where that there is this issue of um, drilling of oil. And the drilling of oil is very, very bad in those places because they leave the land bare. So the people cannot actually uh, use those land for farming purposes. Uh, they're not doing it in a sustainable way where that you wake up and you find the environment is so uncomfortable. There's soot everywhere. So uh, the, the record is not in their country, but they are coming to help us uh, to protest. They are coming to help us to pressure the world leaders to act on it. They are coming to tell, uh, like, the presidents that to stop bringing in investors that actually affect, uh, 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 in a way, affect the countries or bring in uh, uh, activities that actually affect them, but they gain. So if they're doing this, they're in solidarity with us. And I'm hoping that, not really hoping, I know that if everybody is in solidarity with something or in solidarity with you, then the actual thing might be achieved in whichever way it's going to be achieved, but at long last it's achieved and you're going to get uh, positive results. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what can we do to be in solidarity? That's an open question. You don't have to answer it right now. Um, and, uh, and what, so Fridays for the Future, I know you've been involved. Um, curious, there are some younger people in the audience. Has anyone participated in a Fridays, uh, Friday for the Future thing? So, oh, fantastic. So this is something, something that young people can do. And something that parents can support. Are there any parents who've supported a Fridays for the Future thing? What about and what about supporting more education in in uh, in the curriculum in schools? That's another thing parents could do, I suppose. Sorry, this is turning into a sermon. <laughs> uh, any more questions, Helen? Hi, microphone. Can you all hear me? I, I, I only participated in Fridays for Futures because uh, we, as older people, were invited by the youngsters. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been there. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> Ian. Yeah, we, we've been doing a, a project with local schools, Renewable Energy Experiential Learning, which I don't take credit for. It's Sally Morrill smith who's, who's really driving that one forward. And what we're finding increasingly, talking to kids in the age ranges up to sort of 9, 10, 11, is that they do know about climate change. And they are afraid about it too. And the, the thing about real is that we... that This is not a subject that's on the table, really, for for children to talk about grown-ups with. But when we, when we do talk to them about it, you, you, you do find out that they are afraid. And they, I mean, really. And the fact that they, we're taking them out to see people in their locality that are actually doing something about it, and these are not all our projects, these are you know, lo all local projects, it makes a huge difference. And, and I, I think... Yeah, I, I would say, you know, as a, <clears throat> a parent and a grandparent, for, for children to go through this on their own without us kind of recognising or acknowledging what's going on is worse for them than if we, you know, than, than um, trying to tell them everything's going to be okay. So I suppose there's a, there's a role for more intergenerational um, 
Solidarity. Solidarity, <laughs> yeah. What, so what might that look mm -hmm. like? Well, I'll take it in a different perspective, apart from what they have said. You see, uh, as young people, we might not have that much experience as they have, and they are aware of so many issues. So we have that, um, we have that opportunity to consult them first. If we are doing the right thing, of course we are doing the right thing, but we need, the, we need them to see what we are doing, if it's really what they would want us to do, especially when it comes to parents. Parents are really conscious about their, uh, their kids doing something. So we just have to consult them. But mom, dad, what if I do this? Will you be happy? <laughs> yeah. And they'll give you go, uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, parents striking with their kids, like the one that was in Glasgow, a whole family. So I was wondering, like, who, had the, who gave out the information first? Is it the parent or is it the kid that brought out the parents? Mm -hmm. huh? So I was a little bit confused because my parents have never taken that initiative of going <laughs> to the street <laughs> to strike with me. But here I saw like there were families taking together and everything. So my thought was, who, who was the first person to give the information? And if, it, if it's the kids, then that was a good one. Yeah. And uh, it's also important for uh, the parents to tell their kids about what's really happening and the need to take action because actually uh, they're the people that will live long to be affected by these issues. So they need also to just stand up and uh, take the actions that are required. Yeah. And uh, how, does, how do your parents feel about um, all the things that you're involved with? How do they... Well, yeah, how do they, they, they support you? And uh, my father is quite an excited person. If you tell them, <laughs> you tell him about this stuff, he, 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 like he gets excited. My mom is quite of <laughs> quite a reserved person. When you tell him, I'm going to join this group to do this event, he, she has to ask you a lot of questions that are related to that event. If there, there are going to be protests, if there are going to be demonstrations, if the police are going to be involved. If the police are going to in, be involved, or if, she will tell you that, don't come back here crying. <laughs> I already <laughs> warned you. <laughs> so uh, there's always this. Uh, I'm from Siaya. Siaya is a, a neighbor in Kisumu. So Kisumu is known for chaos. So that's where most of the people target for their demonstrations because like most of the press are around that place. The moment there's chaos, they'll just go and capture. So uh, uh, most of the events are always around that place. So if I tell my mom that I'm going to Kisumu, we are going to have this event in Kisumu, then she will just start by, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> but my father will give you... a. Uh, I go ahead, like he doesn't have any problem with that. Yeah. Where is Kisumu? Uh, Western Kenya. Yeah, it's bordering Lake Victoria. Yeah. Any questions uh, from the people in Zoom? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Question up in the back. Uh, hi, Polly. Thank hi. you. Um, I'm specifically um, personally interested in agriculture, and I'm just curious in, first of all, uh, how you teach about agriculture and how to grow things to young kids um, in your own country. And secondly, um, you spoke about resilience in agriculture and using different crops for the climate change. and I'm curious if the crops that you're using as uh, new possibilities, are they, are they sort of local, more to the continent or to your region? And are you looking, at, like, how are you exploring crops from other regions, other parts of the world to incorporate into your, as it were, permacultural systems? Um, yeah, that's those two questions. All right, uh, thank you very much for the question. So in the uh, agricultural initiatives, 
we have two projects, the community project and the school project. So you are talking about the school project. The school project, we, we teach the kids on how to make the, the kitchen gardens, basically the vegetables, so that like they can learn about how to make, to, uh, to take, to make use of small portions of land and not to waste them. And then on the issues of res resilience, the variety are known to that place. We don't take varieties from somewhere else because uh, different places have different ecological zones. So it, you might bring a variety from somewhere that does not do well there. So we have uh, zone specific variety that we use that are also perennial. We find that most of the ones we use are perennial and take quite a long time uh, for them to depreciate. And these ones are provided by this information. We get them from CALRO. CALRO is a research institute in Kenya that have information on specific zones and varieties of crops that you can plant in specific areas. So you don't have to go and bring them from a different area to use in that specific area. Yeah. Oh, the perennial plants are plants that can take like three, four years or even 10 years if you're still harvesting them and still using them. Like the cassava, you just dig a small portion, remove the root and return back the soil, it will still regenerate. So you harvest and it regenerates. Yeah. I had heard something that in uh, the Western countries, there's about 700 different edible leaves. Mm -hmm. Like you are very well known in, in, in Kenya for the amount of delicious leaves that, that are produced and, and the variety of it and how much of the older grains like the sorghum and the millet is being reintroduced more and more. Um, oh yes, uh, that's true. Anything you might call a weed. <laughs> I was with Ian when he was taking me through his greenhouse and I pointed out an oxalism. This is not edible. No, I know this is edible from my place. <laughs> and I had to test it. Because <laughs> I had to test it and actually know that, yes, it's the one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, most of the things that people regard as weeds are food to our place and we use them as vegetables, mm. yeah. <laughs> They're actually delicious. You don't have to be afraid of them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's, uh, what's the one question that, um, that we should have been asking you? <laughs> now, we should focus the questions to them, especially the parents. <laughs> what? Those that have like uh, young kids that feel like taking action. Yeah, what are some of the things like they are going to support them with from now so that their kids can like start taking action on climate issues maybe if they have interest on climate issues. But do you really need to have interest on what determines your future? I don't think so. So maybe as parents that are here, what are you actually... Uh, going to do if you have kids around, if you are maybe nephew or niece, what are you going to do to help, uh, to ensure you help them in taking actions on what they are doing? And for the youth, what are you going to do after this <laughs> in terms of taking action on climate activities? Um, can they email you and let, and let you know by email? <laughs> can you email me? You are postponing your future as well. <laughs> so I guess, you know... Engaged and active, but um, yeah, 
Could you hear what I just said there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the teachers, I think, at school are very keen on the, the kids being engaged and active, but they're told that they sh- shouldn't necessarily be supporting the kids on going for a Friday for the Future march, for example. Um, so I think it's hard for some of the kids then to sort of say, well, I really want to go, I really want to do this. And I know my teachers are keen on this too, but I'm also being told I shouldn't. So there's a whole ambivalence around that. <laughs> it's quite confusing yeah. for you. Uh, if you feel like you don't want to be on the streets, there are personal actions or family actions that you can actually take to reduce uh, this climate crisis thing. So maybe you can start from your home. You can start by going organic. You can start by uh, reducing the plastic uh, stuff in your house. You can start by reusing. Just do something at the household level, maybe if you don't want to be on the streets. Here's a one other question. even if it doesn't all fully make sense, there's that feeling that at that level of the older generations are actually going out there and really um, working with protest, with demand, and leaving a trail of them. Now, mm-hmm. even when they're 15 or 16, there'll be a trail of photos of things that are written of things that have been picked up at home station. So it puts into the family and their parents um, a sense of having Oh, yes, that's a good one. I find there's a lot of synergy between what you were saying about calling on the wisdom of the parents and the grandparents to see what kind of action should I do, and the grandparent holding the space and holding the fort and a certain groundedness in that energy, that active energy that really wants to do something. And I find that synerg- synergy extremely important. And I, I find that in the in the constellation of a family um, with the children, the grandparents, the mothers, the fathers, there is a role, a very different role, but a very strong role for each to take, to channel the energies of each one of them in a certain way, and all need to have a voice, you know, and to be listened to. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I see your hand up, Helen. May I just chime in on this topic? Um, it, it occurs to me that a lot of people uh, nowadays are more aware of um, eco-anxiety, climate anxiety. Um, people are aware of their own feelings of grief and coming to terms with um, what they're learning about the science. And um, might this... And, and people talk about composting that grief. And might this be a time when we can change our relationship to this issue uh, to be one of, of joy in, a, in, in the actions that we might take together as a family, as a community, that, <clears throat> that um, might include uh, having an appropriate relationship to authority that might include having an appropriate relationship to uh, the rules and doing things that, that we know are, are um, uh, consistent and aligned with uh, a higher kind of law, a higher moral purpose, but one that is, that is positive and, and joyful. Mm-hmm. And adding more professionalism like the professionalism part into it, it do work well, yeah. Okay, I thought maybe you would say more. (laughs) 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 
Well, I was just I was saying that because I think you know what what uh, what limits people sometimes, and I, I'm I'm not trying to I'm not trying to um, to shine a light on on what you've shared about your own ambivalence uh, with whether or not to take kids out of school and respecting the authority of the school, but um, how can we move past some of those inhibitions to uh, find ways of I suppose what I'm, what I'm maybe getting at, isn't it time to, to shift our cultures in a way that where change and working for change becomes a normal thing that, and a joyful thing that we're all engaged in? Mm-hmm. And I was hoping you were going to say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> you are, like you're already saying everything. Like, don't we need to act? Don't we need the change? <laughs> we need it. Why, why will you wait for somebody to actually come and tell you that we need it? And you seeing the necessity of actually why we need it. Yeah. So, so I think the, the order of things was, uh, was Helen and uh, this uh, woman here and this woman here. And that woman. I think we could probably hear you, Helen. Yeah. yeah. Hi, folks. We can hear Helen. I, I think the thing about school is, if I could go on about a great length, is that they don't teach you anything that you need to know. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, give us a math from the English. Yeah, okay. But the rest, rubbish. Can I make a case for the regenerative economics program? <laughs> Are we, have we got lift off? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a fan of the school curriculum at all. Uh, what was the other thing? Um, <laughs> what, can we, what can we do? I don't know what we can do. I mean, go on every march I can is the only thing that I can do. Fair point. Thank you. You want to make a point of I think the whole thing about the Fridays for the Future, the Fu- Friday Future March, is that children or students do go out of school. I mean, that's the whole point of it. And as parents, we should be supporting and encouraging our young people to say, well, what do you think is the right thing? I mean, is it more important to do what the teacher says or is it more important to do what we all know we have to do? And I think we have to stand together as parents and as at responsible adults to support our young people when they're wanting to join protests. It's, it's part of our, our education, our duty, and I, I think we need to take that courage to do that, even if we feel it might not be the right thing for the teacher. said Muriel and then Helen so yeah I always get these awkward questions I'm sorry (laughs) Polly Uh, I'm wondering because the word that I always feel is missing in a lot of these talks is the word respect and I'm wondering how you find observing western family um, how would I say uh, interaction compared to uh, Kenyan family interaction. I have a feeling that there was respect might be slightly more present in your society, but perhaps it is not. Perhaps this is an ideal in my head. And I wonder whether, because I feel often like that word respect is often directed to um, another human being. So already that's largely missing, but it's definitely missing towards nature because we just use nature. So I feel like that main thing that as a parent or as a a person in society we can do is to actually watch, and I I do do some of it, I don't do all of it by any means, but watch what I do so that what I do doesn't harm nature. So it's not just doing it, um, how would I say, to, to grow the vegetables, but it's also thinking of 
okay, if I do that, then the ladybird might come, which I did see one today. <laughs> uh, um, and if I don't just push her out anywhere but put her on a leaf, then she's got half a chance to survive. And those are little actions. But to talk to people as we do them, because I do do that when I go for walks. I, I pet dogs, which is a great way of talking with people, but often I will then mention that there's something crossing the road and, oh, watch it, don't put your foot there. Um, and it's just, yeah, every, fi every five minutes is something to share about remembering that this other thing is alive. I, okay. And for I just us, wonder how that, how in Kenya is, is this more or less? Okay. <laughs> for us, respect comes because of the culture and we, we value nature because it's actually related sort of to our culture, to some of the things that bind us. Look at the rivers. Some of us go to worship to the rivers. Some of us value some trees, especially the fig trees. It's too much here. We value it because some of the communities or people go to pray there. Some people value the mountains. So they take care of those those tufts. It's it's attached to the culture. So you, you give respect to it because you feel there's a supernatural power attached to it. That's why most of the people uh, uh, really give respect to them. But if you really feel you're not attached to them in the spiritual way or in the cultural way, you wouldn't really take care of it as, you, as everyone expects. So uh, most, just as I said, most of the most of the people in Kenya take care of nature because of the the culture factor and the spirituality attached to it, unlike uh, the Western world. Yeah. Um, well, Polly's actually kind of spoken to what was coming up for me when we were talking about parenting and like what. I feel my role is as a parent towards my young people. And what I'm really, really clear on is nature is this multiplicity of beauty and difference. And we are part of that. And as Polly's speaking so beautifully to her culture is embedded with that understanding and that relational sense. So respect is inherent and the passion to bring through nature in our way is, is present in that. And so for me as a parent, my job is to unpick what is disconnecting me from my natural self and lead the way for my children and not to overlay my views about what they should be doing. I mean, I, poor Jackson, I dragged him on the Occupy March, you know, when he was four in a top hat and a banker's outfit. And, you know, I mean, I've done, you know, my share of things, but it is about, for me, it is about us refinding our natural relationship and supporting our children in finding their natural relationship to connection. And it, it's not necessarily going to be the way it looks. I mean, my little boy, I brought the older one, we brought him up on Dartmoor, and he's home tonight on his computer gaming with his friends. And they're talking, they're having conversations. They're very aware of, of what is happening in the world. They can feel it in their bodies. So for me, it's about not, you know, not getting caught up in my judgments about what actions he's choosing to take. Just keeping the conversation going, supporting him in his connection to himself, and then through that, his connection to nature and and he'll come he'll come into alignment because that's nature <laughs> uh saif maybe maybe this will be the last question and we'll start winding down uh, thank you for what's your name you just mentioned yeah, helen um, so I wanted to build up on, on Helen's point, um, like my perception to the crisis that we're having now, uh, the climate crisis. Like I feel that it's a crisis of relationship, uh, that we lost uh, sense with, with the local land, we lost sense with, with our communities, we lost, we lost connection with, with our neighbours and our responsibility towards our neighbours. Uh, we lost sense, uh, we, lost, we lost the connection with... Uh, our responsibility towards our local areas and our streets. And I'm saying this in, uh, in relation to two countries I lived in, in the Middle East, 
Jordan and Iraq, uh, where every house has a responsibility towards the seven, seventh house on both sides. And there, basically, when we talk about action, and that's building on the point that we, when, you, when you talked about like, what, kind, what kind of action that we need to inspire, and I often feel when it comes to change making or action taking, it ha it's often been portrayed as a massive responsibility that people have to take or something huge that needs to be done that can overwhelm those who have limited resources, have limited time, or um, kind of they, they can't afford sh going on the streets, for example. They can't afford leaving their, jo their jobs for a few hours because those two hours can bring extra food on the table. And I feel that, like, how can we move from a culture where action taking and change making is a massive business or something that can get people get lost into a void of something can be quite abstract um, that can propel the anxiety of me meeting something that doesn't have a size and can feel so gigantic and so crippling to the individual to, to, to face it with their limited resources. How can we move from a conversation that's so overwhelming into something that's more relational, where we kind of talk about a language of belonging? Like we're hovering for the majority of the time. We're talking about these massive concepts. Some, some of them can be translated into practical action, can be big and overwhelming. But where is the relationship in these conversations? So I'm really thankful for the practical examples that you gave, which I miss often in, in talks when it comes to climate change. I often are kind of feeling that I'm facing this vague and massive canvas of kind of like, right, show me the way, something practical that I can practice as an individual person who may not be able to set up an initiative, who may not be able to kind of rally a group and go on the street, something on day-to-day -day basis that could inspire me, inspire other people, but through the lens of relationship and belonging, like how can I treat my community, my area as a home? Like, and I leave with the question like, what if the planet was our home? What if my local area was my, was my home? What is my responsibility then? So yeah, I just wanted to leave you um, with this because I, it's a frustration in me that when I turn up to conversations or conferences, I. I leave feeling kind of right. I am inspired by some of the amazing conversations, but like, what can I do now? So I want to thank you uh, for, for the practical examples that you gave that balance the inspiring conversations that, that, that I found in this talk. And I invite us, you, and those who hold such incredible pan, uh, platforms to cultivate and inspire people to look at life, look at action through the, through the lens of uh, through the lens of relationship and belonging. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that, Saif. So, um, in that spirit, I invite everyone to linger <laughs> before you leave, and uh, come and say hi to Polly. Come and say hello to Saif. Come and say hello to Jem and Alana and Declan and uh, that maybe you haven't met before or, or talk to somebody that maybe you don't know very well. You don't have to be in a hurry uh, to leave. Um, do you have any, uh, any final observations? And Polly, I'll give you the last word, but Johara. Yeah, I think I'm very inspired by, by the two last comments and um, and thinking about rebalancing and how we are so out of whack, our systems are out of whack, and rebalancing our relationships, in particular to, to the non-humans, to other humans. And, and as, a, as a practical thing, as a next step, is to actually listen, to listen, and try to understand other forms of solutions that we might not hear so be in relationship in a way that we can hear solutions to this crisis that we are not trained or not used to hear. And this can be um, maybe voices of people who are not heard and, and who do not speak, 
other ways of um, interpreting the world and understanding the world and showing up in this world. Um, but it can also be the magic of life and hearing those solutions, those alignments. Mm. Thanks, Johara. And Polly, any, any last thoughts? This, this slide is very... <laughs> I think it's working with my topia. Ah. Okay, so what I always do tell people is that don't wait to be told to take action on something you're already seeing. It's affecting you. And uh, furthermore, it's going to affect the generation behind you. It's going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your grandkids. It's going to affect uh, your great-grandkids. So always uh, stand up and take action. Whatever the small action you take, it's still remarkable. And I'm hoping it's good today we met here and had a discussion. From what we talked about and what we have not talked about, please go back home and take the little action you feel is right for the community, you feel it's right for this world, and also you feel it, it's right for your kids and for the entire family. I'm still in thoughtness. And Seven, so I'm hoping to see you around, guys. Such a small town that I can just <laughs> walk around anytime. Thank you for hosting me. Thanks. That sounds like an invitation, everyone. <laughs> so, Holly, uh, he... yeah, absolutely. Um, so amazing. Uh, that you've come so far from Kenya, from Glasgow. Uh, also, the work that you do is so amazing and inspiring, but you're also just a normal person. <laughs> and so um, just huge gratitude. Thanks for spending some time with us today mm -hmm. and thank look forward to so seeing you more over the next week or so. Oh, yeah, thank you. So thanks once again, <laughs> Polly. This is for you. <laughs>